Hey everybody, it's Bina007 back with a second part of our Agatha Christie reread. And once again, I'm warming you up for the full Vassals of Kingsgrave episodes, where a few of us will discuss some of her most famous novels. But with the mission of being a completionist as ever, we're going to have a short discussion today of the 1922 published novel, so a full hundred years ago, The Secret Adversary. And there are many things that are audacious about this novel. First of all, having had a great deal of success with her first closed house murder mystery, The Mysterious Affair at Styles, that Agatha Christie should now publish a completely different genre, one of a murder mystery that's really a thriller in which the who done it is not who committed a simple murder, but actually who is behind a vast criminal conspiracy. Remember that Agatha Christie is still on her first novel deal with the Bodley Head, a publishing deal that was very unfavourable to her. So she rattles through her first few books and she very much needs the money. This is the post-World War I period where she is married to Archibald Christie. He has yet to find employment in the city, in the financial centre of London. And really, for two very well brought up middle class people who are used to a certain standard of life, money is very short. And that is exactly what you see reflected in this novel, which I think is an absolutely fantastic, pacey thriller. Um, it, you rattle through it. It has real forward momentum. Um, it reads like a John Buchan spy thriller, but I think far funnier. In fact, for me, it's almost a cross between a John Buchan spy novel and a P.G. Woodhouse comedy. And the lead characters of Tommy and Tuppence, um, I think, are really, really sort of charismatic and fun to be around. It's a novel that's really unusual because with Agatha Christie, her great famous detectives, Mrs. Marple and Hercule Poirot, start off old and stay old. But in this novel, Tommy and Tuppence start off very young. You know, they're both in their early 20s, having um, sort of served in World War One very much as Agatha Christie did. And as you go forward in her writings, they age up. So that's unusual. And there aren't very many of the Tommy and Tuppence novels. But, and it's kind of interesting because Agatha Christie doesn't hold the novels in particularly high regard, but she really loves them as a pair of characters. And I think that's because they emulate, in a way, how she wanted to live her life. Tuppence Beresford, um, the girl, being very much a new woman, capital N, capital W. And their marriage, they go on to get married, being very much a marriage of equals. And not a marriage that she had with Archibald Christie. Um, and certainly not a marriage that one would have seen around and about the times of 1922 middle class England. So once again, I make the argument that Agatha Christie really is incredibly progressive in some of her views about gender relationships and work, um, while also still being regressive or of her time when it comes to other prejudices. So as the novel opens, it's 1922 when it's published, but it's written um, slightly earlier. We are in a London that is full of demobilised soldiers who are finding it very hard to get work. This is very true to the time. Food is hard to come by. Money is hard to come by. Um, England really is in a bad state after World War I. And there are many girls like Tuppence and Agatha Christie who were brought up in rather genteel middle class circumstances, but who had had to become nurses and effectively domestic servants during the war, as Agatha Christie had. And so they've seen far more of life and of society than their parents would ever have expected of them. Um, and it leaves them in a very socially liminal and fluid part of society, which I find fascinating and very particular to this time. The other thing that we have to remember is that this novel was written in the shadow of the Russian Revolution, where a great royal family had fallen, revolution had taken place, and much of Western Europe was absolutely in fear of communist revolt. And you can just imagine in this very um, impecunious England where people are unemployed, there's mass unemployment, the rise of trade unionism, the fear of the establishment of revolution and communist infiltration was incredibly high. So both in the fact that we have new women and incipient flappers, um, as we'd come to see in that part of um, in America and in England later on in the 1920s, and in that paranoia about communism, this really is a novel that speaks to its time. So as we open the novel, we have Tommy and Tuppence running into each other in London. They're old childhood friends. And T Tuppence has bobbed hair and she wears a short skirt and she smokes. 
Um, and she very much is a modern woman who is full of entrepreneurial um, pioneering spirit and as she who tells her former demobbed soldier friend Tommy that they should go into business as the young adventurers limited they have little to recommend themselves except for their energy and willingness to literally do anything for money and they put an ad in a newspaper asking for work and that's what starts us off on the adventure and this is very much a modern novel insofar as they're meeting always at tube stations and having um, meals at the Lion's Tea House, which was a chain of um, tea houses, kind of like Starbucks coffee would be today. But it was a safe place for unchaperoned women of a certain station to meet with men. And the hustle and bustle of these Lion's Tea Houses um, allows for some of the major plot points because you get to overhear conversations from people for all sorts of walks of life. So as the novel progresses, we have Tommy and Tuppence effectively taken on by the British Secret Services to try and find a woman called Jane Finn. Now, Jane Finn was last seen on the Lusitania, which was a great steamship that um, was the victim of a German U-boat bombing campaign. This would have been known to everyone reading the novel at the time. It would have been like knowing about the sinking of the Titanic and a little bit how Downton Abbey, the TV series, starts off with the sinking of a Titanic and characters being lost. This is quite a similar opening in a way because it takes a very sort of well-known um, episode in history and spins a tale from it. And what we're led to believe is that as this ship is going down and women and children are being rescued first, a desperate diplomat slash spy gives Jane Finn, because he knows that she will be rescued first and have a better chance of survival, a oilskin packet containing a secret draft treaty between the Allied powers and presumably Russia at the time, although we never know. It's a little bit of a MacGuffin. And he asks her, are you an American patriot? If so, please do me the favour, get this document on, off the ship and give it to the American ambassador into his own hands. That is the prologue. Jane Finn goes off with the secret document and is not heard of again. We fast forward now a few years and everyone wants their hands on this draft treaty. Um, the British government, because they think it will be incredibly embarrassing if it comes to light, the secret adversary, because he knows it will be embarrassing to the British government, and he thinks its publication will help foment a communist revolution in Britain. And if you think that sounds kind of completely melodramatic and unreasonable and absurd, you have to remember that at the time of writing, um, Britain was subject to great strikes. And a few years later, we would have a general strike in England, um, which was very much seen as a pivotal moment and that could have gone either way. So this is not an absurd uh, proposition at the time of writing. And I think that of itself gives you the value of Agatha Christie, because as she moves through the decades, she can really learn so much about the social history of England and also of Europe in its wider sense at this time. So Tommy and Tuppence are sent to find Jane Finn. And I'm not going to give you too many of the twists and turns because I think there's a lot to be gained from reading the plot of this novel and some wonderful um, unexpected plot twists take place. They are, as I said, working for Mr. Carter of the Secret Service, but they also hook up with Julius Hersheimer, who is Jane Finn's American cousin. And he is simply rolling in money, the son of a steel magnet, and is holed up at the Ritz Hotel. And a lot of the, the writing of its time is these very impecunious middle class kids suddenly being at the Ritz and eating lavish meals. And uh, as Agatha Christie always calls them, creamy cakes. And if you know about Agatha Christie, she loved her creamy cakes. And that's why when you see her in pictures in her older years, like myself, her waistline is very much a victim of those creamy cakes. But I think for people brought up in the shadow of World War One, when when there really wasn't much food around, this obsession is very clear. And you even see it in books like Evelyn Waugh's Brideshead Revisited, where in later years, he says he regrets how much time he spent just describing food. But having written it at a time of rationing, um, that seemed like a very valid obsession to have. So as the story progresses, we find Tommy and Tuppence getting into scrapes, dealing with kidnappings and murders and poisonings and trying to find where Jane Finn is. Has she been kidnapped? Is she being held against her own will? What is fascinating in this story is that we are going to discover as part of the denouement that Jane Finn has been faking 
amnesia so that the people who've captured her can't pump her or think they can't pump her for information. And for those of you who know a little bit about the Agatha Christie story, you will know that in a few years' time, she is going to disappear for 10 days um, at the height of a bad marriage when she realises her husband is cheating on her. And it is to be debated, and she was never clear about this, what happened in that period. But one argument is that she was also faking amnesia. So just file that little piece of information back in your brain. But I want to read you a little bit about why I find this book fascinating. And it is because of the relationship between Tommy and Tuppence and, and the fun that they have together. And this is the way that it is described in a wonderful book that's out of print, but you can get it secondhand, called Agatha Christie, The Woman and Her Mysteries by Gillian Gill. Um, and she goes into great critical um, descriptions of the early novels in particular. And you can also hear um, an interview with her on a wonderful podcast that goes through all of these novels in far more detail called All About Agatha. And I would 100% um, recommend that if you really love Agatha Christie, you listen to that because it's, it's a wonderful, very detailed description of what goes on in these books. So this is what Gillian Gill has to say about Toppy, Tommy and Tuppence. As the plot carries them into one death-defying situation after another, each relies on the other's competence and admires the other's special talents. Tommy provides the common sense, the brawn and the professional contacts, while Tuppence provides the brain power, the flair and the audacity. These two charming, intelligent and energetic people figure in a fantasy world, and a rather dated one at that. Nonetheless, their panache, the combination each has of being hot and cool, humorous and sexy, needful and independent, offers an unusual and vital form of male-female professional and private cooperation. And this is the bit that I find really interesting when you compare Agatha Christie with her contemporary writers. I think Gillian Gill makes a really phenomenal point about how she is far more progressive because she does show entrepreneurial, um, equally important women who aren't just sort of fantasy figures off in the distance and rather nefarious ones as that. So this is what Gillian Gill goes off to say. From the, the example we commonly find in the novels of the American hard-boiled school of detective fiction, the heroes of Chandler or Spillane or Hammett fall for mysterious blondes who do them wrong and they employ intelligent, snappy, hard-working, reliable brunettes as secretaries. So I think there's something to be said for Tuppence as a really fascinating woman who represents her time, but also something very different from what we're seeing in contemporary American or even English fiction. So Tommy and Tuppence for the win. Very overlooked because people know about Marple and Poirot, but very much worth your time and attention. So what can we say about this novel in terms of its maybe more dated aspects? Um, it is very much set at a time that is post-war, and that means that we've just, in England, fought a war against the Germans. Um, so there is a bit of Hun bashing, to use a horrible word. Um, so, And there's also a lot of what I think is normal in that period, and also from Sherlock Holmes and others, of sort of the physiognomy being indicative of moral worth. So there is casual racism against German Russians and indeed Poles. Um, there's there's a phrase, there's a quotation, the low beetling brows and the criminal jaw, as if you can see someone's moral defects in their face. Um, there's a wonderful character called Albert, who is a working class servant who turns out to be quite pivotal and helpful in the plot. And I think also underlines the sort of the liminal line between upper and working classes at the time. Um, one thing I do want to point out is there is a character who's obviously Jewish called Julius Hersheimer, who is incredibly rich. And that could be seen as a kind of cliche of the very successful capitalist um, Jew at the time. But he is painted incredibly sympathetically. And without spoiling the ending, I think it is again and again fascinating with Agatha Christie that she might use your prejudices or the prejudices of a contemporary reader against them by leading you down into a red herring and actually showing that the person who is really the criminal mastermind is someone that you might, if you were prejudiced, um, not suspect in the least. So I'll leave it there. But if you read this novel, you'll see what I mean. And see that despite um, casual prejudice 
that is shown by some characters, and even Tommy sometimes in a bit of misogyny. Those prejudices are always shown to upend you, and that if you had viewed things in their reality and people for their merits, you would have um, calculated the correct outcome for the novel far more quickly. So I think Agatha Christie is very slippery when it comes to these things. There's also, for those of you of a progressive turn of mind, quite a sort of funny um, little final coda, where if you read it carefully, you realise that um, not the hero and heroine, but another couple who have recently got together are going back to a hotel for some casual premarital sex, which I think, again, is rather daring for its time. And I love it because it's showing again in this character and in Tuppence that actually it's the women who are in the driving seat, both in business and in demanding and getting what they want romantically. And if you read to the end of the novel, you realise it's very much Tuppence who is um, engineering a proposal between her and Tommy for them to get married at the end of the novel. So these really are new women indeed. Of course, there are many adaptations of all of Agatha Christie's novels, um, less so of the Tommy and Tuppence ones. If you do want to watch this rather than read it, I would highly recommend a 1983 feature length film starring Francesca Annis, but it's rather hard to get hold of. It is, however, very faithful to the novel, so you'll get the plot in its entirety in lovely costumes. So 1983, um, The Secret Adversary starring Aunt Francesca Annis. Um, There is a modern 2015 TV version in three parts um, called Partners in Crime, starring um, the British comedian, now children's novelist David Walliams and Jessica Raines. I would not, however, recommend this. Um, It's very unfaithful to the novel, not just in transporting it to the 1950s. Um, They make Tommy rather a fool um, and it's, it's very dark. It doesn't preserve the fast pace. It doesn't preserve the comedy. Um, There is, of course, still a communist panic in the UK in the 1950s as the Cold War starts, but it just feels really limp and flat and not at all enjoyable. So if you do want to watch it, do try and hunt down the 1983 version on your streaming services. So with that, I will sign out. Hopefully, again, this is a little teaser for the full-fledged Agatha Christie reread series. Um, I think if you read Tommy and Tuppence novels, alongside the murder mysteries they are jarringly different but I really did love this it's it's a sort of two to three hour read it's great fun it's John Buchan-esque um, it gives you a great flavour of a certain early 1920s feeling so if you want to wind back in time by a century and see what a new woman was in that era then please do give it a go with that I wish you great enjoyment from whatever it is you're reading this week and I hope to speak to you soon Thank you.